Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Doolittle. I had the great opportunity of speaking for, on the 2020 Mold Summit. It's one of those um, summits that you know how you always see the um, things come out with like what are some of the pro tips from many different practitioners who are specialists in these different fields and the best of the best doctors get to speak on this and I am so gratefully honored to be have been able to speak on this. Dr. Margaret Christensen was the host for this. She put this together. She is also somebody who I have the great opportunity of working with at Carpathia Collaborative where I do see patients in practice in the clinic whenever I'm not seeing them digitally on Zoom. So I'm going to share with you that talk that I gave for that summit, just so that you can get some of that information too from how mycotoxicity and neuroplasticity work together. So let's switch over. I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see. All right, so what I went through was just a little bit of the detail about neuroplasticity, mycotoxicity. I'll explain both of those terms. We know mycotoxicity comes from typically a black mold that can create many, many issues within the brain. Um, and of course, there's many other things like fungi. Um, we can have information from other biochemical sources besides just mold, but this one was targeted for that. So let's talk about a few facts that I just find super fascinating about the brain. So there are 100 billion neurons total in the brain. It's like people with the connections that between all of these, there's like 100 or 1 trillion, 1 quadrillion connections in the brain. So this is because each single cell, each single brain cell is connected to about 25,000 other brain cells and as multiple synaptic connections to each of these brain cells, that can be up to like 40,000 individual connections. So um, if we think about this, like how does that occur? How does it, um, is it like one specific brain cell um, has like maybe two or three? Well, we can actually neuroplastically create more connections, synaptic connections by exercise, specific exercise. And that's something I'd like to be sharing with you guys today and talking about some of the exercises you guys can do to regrow, restructure those brain cells. So whenever you think about all these different connections, there are actually more connections in the human brain than there are stars in the universe. That's a beautiful concept. So the computational power of the brain is mind blowing. It is so incredible. There are actually 10 trillion operations per second that occur within the brain um, in a waking day. And it's about 10 to 23 watts are generated, depending on how much brain activity is occurring. The myth of 10% of your brain getting used, that is totally just a myth. It's not true. In every single 24 hour period, we do use at least 100% of our brain. Um, it's just different activities that are occurring, different actions, different thoughts, even for the brain to be able to communicate to all the other organ systems that requires computational power. So that's actually really incredible to think about how much energy gets used for your brain all day long, every single day. And there's actually a difference and a disparity in the speed that these messages can travel. Some messages will travel at very slow speed of 1.5 feet per second, and others can travel at 400 feet per, feet per second up to 268 miles per hour. Pretty mind blowing. Um, okay, so I like to teach my patients the concept of a plump brain is a healthy brain. We've got to keep it plumped up, keep it healthy. That's what we, how we prevent the atrophy and degeneration from occurring. So 75% of your brain is actually water. This is why it is so important for us to stay hydrated, very healthy hydration. Of, I teach patients the equation of half your body weight, that's how many ounces of water at a minimum you're supposed to be drinking. So if you work out, if you are um, going to the sauna, if it's a hot day outside, a hundred degree day, you've got to drink more water than just half your body weight in ounces. But that's at least a minimum to start out with, and then we go up from there. And we know that the water that we drink is also important for that we have the right electrolyte balance, cell salts, all of that. Um, I have a couple of blog posts about those things, and you can read up on that. It's so important that we're able to have the proper minerals that are coming in. We have a healthy filtered source of water, um, and we need to make sure that 
Uh, if we have more acidity in our body, maybe in our diet, if we're eating more meats and things that are acidic, well, then we also need to balance that out with alkaline water as much as possible or alkalinity in the diet, like with green juices, green vegetables, those types of things, which are excellent sources of water as well. Um, I don't like for my patients to think about juice as adding into the water intake though, because there's just varying degrees of how much of that um, actually gets used as water and how much is just used to pull that um, fiber through. So I say water is separate from all of the other things that they're drinking, the vegetable juices and such. 60% of the brain, of the dry weight of the brain, is actually made up of fat. So what we know is that healthy fats are crucial. Omega-3s to omega-6s. I'm always teaching my patients about the proper balance of omega-3s to omega-6s. I also have a blog post about that, so you can read up more on that. But we know that those omega-6s and omega-3s, when they're in the proper balance, as well as having proper vitamin E, um, I love algae sources for these. Uh, we can make sure that we have, you know, like healthy nuts, healthy like walnut oil, for example. That helps to balance out that proper ratio, as well as flaxseed, hip seed on the omega-3 side. And having that balance is what fuels and plumps up that brain so that you're able to have the right computational power that you need. And I'll talk about why the fat in the brain is so important for the speed of the transactions or movements or messages. Um, and whenever we talk about how much energy this brain needs, we have to go back to the concept of it's actually using, did you know that the brain takes 20% of our blood, oxygen, and calories that we intake? That's incredible. So all that you're taking in, and if you're using more brain activity, have you noticed that you actually are more hungry and you've got to feed your brain, fuel your brain? Like if you're studying for a test or you're uh, working on a big project for your career or uh, whatever you're doing that's fueling, using that brain, you've got to fuel, fuel those sources. There are actually 100,000 miles of blood vessels in the brain. That is beautiful. That's also another reason why it's very important for you to have proper adjustments to the atlas and access the cervical vertebrae, because if you have the atlas specifically adjusted properly, then we know that those vertebral arteries that are sending lots of that blood flow up to that concealed part of the brain, we know that that's able to um, really get the, the proper blood flow in without having compression on it. So make sure that you have a good chiropractor working on you. Okay, gray matter versus white matter. This is very important for us to talk about when we're talking about biochemical inflammation, biotoxins from the mold. Gray matter, it actually is made up of, it's like 90% of the, the neurons and cells are in the cerebral cortex in the gray matter. Well, what if we think about this, like this is uh, what, why there's so much of a high metabolic activity in there. And that's why mycotoxins and mold toxins fungi and all that, they love to go towards that gray matter because they get food sources, they get all that fuel that they need to. And that's where the inflammation first starts to occur and then that leads to subsequent atrophy. Well, the white matter itself, that's like the insulation for these nerve fibers, the myelination. Myelination is like a fatty sheath and that's what makes it where those nerve fibers, as we were talking about how rapidly they send that signal, they're just like fire and like bounce across the little myelin sheath and that's what speeds up that transmission of that signal so that you're able to think as quickly as you need. Um, that's really like a, the network for the neuronal communication and the gray matter is the processing power of the brain. So let's talk about, let's zoom out for a little bit about how we have to address the different traumas that it can occur that lead to neuroinflammation. We've been discussing like on this bottom part of the biotoxins, the exposures, the antigens, pollutants, and things like that that can lead to neuroinflammation. And we know, of course, biotoxins, fungi and all that, they're living, so they actually can continue growing. And that's why we have to keep it in check and try to pull it out of the brain and try to get it back into proper balance, synergistic balance. But also antigens, say from foods, if we have a food type that we are reacting to, that leads to inflammation in the brain. And of course, you're, you've probably seen some of my other talks or read my blog posts about gluten and how that could be one of those major antigens. It's because it's just a foreign molecule now that it's been genetically modified so much and our body sees it and it has no idea what to do with it. So flags it, tags it, cre creates an immunological response against it, may lead to neuroinflammation. 
pollutants, glyphosates, all of the pesticides, fertilizers, um, preservatives that we put all over our food, that is just fueling the immune attack on the brain and all that inflammation because what is it doing? It's just flowing around our blood flow and toxins love fatty matter, not just biotoxins. This is also other toxins. Think about like a ball of butter that you roll across a table full of shrapnel or little metal shavings. That butter is going to pick up all that shrapnel. Well, that's what our brain can do because of all that healthy, delicious fats up there that the toxins just stick up to. So we got to prevent that. Also traumatic brain injury, of course, us hitting our head, getting concussions, even mild whiplash injuries from a little car accident can lead to concussive neuroinflammation. So it's very important that we're understanding traumatic brain injuries. So important for us to have a log when the traumatic brain injuries occur. We know the first one, it's bad, but subsequent trauma, subsequent concussions afterwards really can lead to even more detrimental effects on the brain. So it's very important if you've had one, two, three concussions, be really careful. Protect your brain. We're helmet when you're doing crazy things out there. Okay, stress and PTSD. We know that emotional traumas are also a very big source of neuroinflammation. We, it's so, so tragic how many adverse childhood events can occur. We call them ACEs in the brain, and we actually are, we will log this with our patients whenever they first come in, or whenever we're first meeting with them in their consultations online. And we talk about Okay, let's, let's very gently discuss how, have you had adverse childhood events? Have you, even whenever you were older um, in your teens or whenever you were an adult, did you have these major traumas, these major stressful events? Because that all leads to chronic ongoing neural inflammation. That causes the immune system to be reacting within the brain. And we've got to get that inflammation calmed down. We've got to get those emotional traumas back into a realm that your brain can handle and deal with it, even if it's in the subconscious, because a lot of people put it way back there in the back of the brain and try not to deal with it too much in the frontal because we've got to really just, you know, be clicked into life and we can't constantly be dwelling on that. However, those emotional traumas stay in there in that subconscious and keep on affecting our brain, keep on causing that neural inflammation. PTSD, major traumas, of course that leads to it. So that's very important to start healing those areas. Okay, so some symptoms that are overlapping, I'd like to show the site to some of the patients for uh, how concussions, like some of the symptoms there on the side versus the PTSD, that can actually have, you, there's a lot of symptoms there in the center that can be caused by either. And so we need to address that and we can see those, the correlation of those symptoms. And also those symptoms, it's not just pertaining to these only. Um, the symptoms that I see in the middle actually are more linked to biotoxins, um, to toxin pollutants, and also to like antigenic and neuroinflammation. I see those cognitive dysfunction, disorientation, altered taste and smell, toxins, all over the place I'm thinking that. Um, sleep disturbances, yes, we get that with concussions, traumatic brain injuries, with stress, but also with those toxins. Depression, anxiety, fatigue, those are some of the main ones. Fatigue, especially. Oh my goodness, that's, I know that there are toxins that are just bogging down the, um, it's like a, a, about how our body is able to process through toxins and really conjugate them out of our system so that we can, you know, excrete them. And those detoxification centers, that takes a lot of energy as well as the brain. Of course, it also takes energy, but the liver, if we've got that proper detoxification, pathway working, then we're using up that energy very quickly if we've got lots of toxins coming in. So we've got to cut off where the toxins are coming from. We've got to make sure that we're neuroplastically wiring and helping to heal the area that we got the traumatic brain injury on. We've got to make sure that we're healing the PTSD, the uh, emotional traumas, adverse childhood traumas, all those things before we can truly have the, that state of healing that occurs and then the ongoing subsequent steps. So let's talk about some of the brain changes that occur with mold illness. Edema, that's like a swelling, and that will just be a brain on fire. Atrophy is like the shrinkage of the brain, and that's where it kind of shrinks in on itself, and that's what we're more concerned about for neurodegeneration and the really ongoing. It's a little bit easier 
a little bit quicker to be able to calm down the edema as we're working with that to calm down the neural inflammation, especially if we can remove what's causing the inflammation. The atrophy is a little bit more difficult. It takes a little bit longer to get that neuroplastic changes, but we can in most cases, um, not always. Once there's a certain point of neurodegeneration, it's tough to recall some of those or um, regenerate some of those neural synaptic connections. However, we do as best as we can to really just slow the degenerative process. And if we're in an early state of atrophy, then we gotta switch that up and change it around as quickly as possible. So that's why it's very crucial to be working with your functional neurologist to get those exercises specific for you and be doing them daily for months, two months, three months, however long it takes to really regrow those neurosynapses. So neuroquads is what I use quite frequently in my practice. In addition to um, neuro exam, which I also do digitally, uh, now I have like the entire neuro exam like switched to where I'm able to see you on webcam as a patient and you go through the neuro exam findings for me, I'm able to watch and you're going to do all these different um, procedures with somebody present uh, so that we can you know, work through the exam process. But I also, like to compare this with neural quant imaging. So this is where we take a brain MRI that was done by 3D T1 weighted uh, MRI machine, high quality pictures that go get sent over to cortex labs. And this neural quant shows us all the different brain structures laid out, how they can be atrophied or inflamed. So like, for example, um, the areas that are red are flagged as red or the highlighted red when it's above 95th percentile or 95%. And that's for a normative approach of like the 50% right in the middle of for your age group, your um, where you are in your life, if you're female, female, uh, actually like it takes into account the size of your brain as well and all that. So what we know is that if it's above 95% and we get, we have the blue inflammation below 5% is atrophy and that's the red. So that's what we look at for um, our patients. This is one of my patients in uh, my clinic practice and this patient had Marcon's, which is a bad type of bacteria that really likes to hide way up in the sinuses and then also ongoing EBV. And so you can see where there are a couple of brain changes there. The symptoms that were associated with this patient were um, ADD, anxiety, memory, chronic pain. And so let's talk about some of the other symptoms that mycotoxicity really will affect in the brain. And I'm going to show you a neuroquant that is correlated with a patient that has mycotoxicity in their system and it's ongoing. And you'll see how it's much different than the neuroquant that we just saw. Some of these symptoms are what our patients deal with, and then we kind of covered that a little bit when we were talking about the PTSD versus the trauma, but also you can see how these were correlated, especially with that center and with the traumatic brain injury. We know psychological stressors, patients complain of um, anxiety, depression, mood changes, chronic fatigue, huge for detoxification, of course, all the detox pathways and then also in the brain, muscle weakness, exhaustion, just it's hard to get up and do your daily, every single daily activity. You just don't want to do it. You just don't have the energy for it. Don't have the mental space for it, mental capacity for it, mental brain memory loss and brain fog. It's huge difficulty keeping up with what's required of you in your career or in your family life or everything that you're needing to do every single day. It's so tough. Insomnia, which is actually one of those cascade of events because the more insomnia that you have, the worse you're sleeping, the less regeneration you have in your brain, and it just keeps on going from there. Thermoregulation issues, this is um, definitely something that's important. This is about our hot versus cold balances and how we're able to uh, maintain that. Light, sound, smell, sensitivity, breathing and digestive issues. Of course, that's like one of those catch-22s that wherever you have that going on, you're getting less of that oxygen into the brain, less of that healthy um, fuel for the brain, the brain sources, the nutritive power. And so the computations per second is going to come down. You're not going to be able to handle all that brain activity that you were able to handle before. That's very important that we work on that breathing and digestive issues. With my patients in the practice, and I always teach them how to do um, exercises for their diaphragms. The diaphragm actually lays like this. It's a um, like a muscle that has to be exercised just like any other muscle in our body. And we think, oh, it's getting exercised. We breathe every single day. Well, we need to make sure that we're actually putting in more stimulation to get really healthy deep breaths, deep breathing exercises. This is why they're so important. 
So that's one of the crucial things to do. And then we also know that uh, the digestive tract, it sits down below. So it may, we, we want to make sure that that stomach is not sitting up on top of the diaphragm because sometimes that gets pulled up. That's called a hiatal hernia. So it's very important to check with, um, you if you have a chiropractor that checks soft mobility or soft tissue mobility and all that to make sure that the valves are moving appropriately, the stomach is pulled down, make sure that you don't have a hiatal hernia, make sure your digestion is uh, moving well, make sure that we've got the proper gastral uh, like movement and the pumping action that breaks down the, the foods. And I can definitely just go on and on about that, but that's another talk for another day because it's very extensive and we'll just keep going with it. Breathing, back on breathing one more second. I wanna talk about the how important it is to get proper rib adjustments as well, to get rib expansion. That rib expansion is what allows for that oxygen to get up to the brain. We have plenty of oxygen for usage, which we have to have for every single um, brain activity that we need to do. Okay, so this is just a nice little diagram that shows a, an overlay of the functions. And it's very minimal because of course the brain takes care of many other things. And then also all these functions are dependent on other parts of the brain too. But it just gives us like an all over zoomed out approach. So the frontal lobe, this is our judgment, foresight, our voluntary movement. This is our frontal lobe connection. This is our um, really like how our brain is able to be clicked in, cognitive functioning, cognitive thought, our uh, decision making processes, executive function, all of that is very important for that frontal lobe. Uh, we've got some of our motor cortex, parietal lobe, uh, sensory function in the parietal lobe, that's up. Um, we've got the temporal lobe down at the bottom, as you can see, that's our intellectual emotional functions. That's what's taking in our auditory signals all day, every day, and it's just telling our brain how to think. It's also very connected to the limbic system. So our limbic system is always dealing with um, telling us how our outside environment is affecting us. And that's what tells us whether we should have a sympathetic or parasympathetic response. Should we be concerned? Should we be stressed? Is there something going on outside in the outside world, the environment around us that is a stressor? Or can we rest, digest, and relax and be that parasympathetic, easygoing mode? So that's very important. We know that we have um, language centers, parietal lobe as well. That's parietal lobe um, coordination. Some, some of the times of that somewhat is uh, cerebellum, Wernicke's, Broca's, a couple of other regions of the brain that we've got to have working properly, functioning properly for us to have good communication and speech and enunciation and all that. Uh, we have some of the regions in the back, the occipital lobe, that's our visual centers. The temporal lobe, of course, is hearing. I mentioned that already earlier. Um, cerebellum is coordination, coordination of movement, coordination of that, coordination of immune system, too. So very important. Brain stem, down at the bottom. This is our like most basic functions of keeping us alive. This is our swallowing, breathing. It uh, has uh, some communication, neurocommunication to the heart. So this is how uh, your beats per minute, how many beats per minute you have. If your heart rate goes up or down and blood pressure changes, it can actually have an impact on that, influence on that. So all of those involuntary functions that make us stay alive. That's important to have that brain system functioning well so we don't have to spend our cognitive cortical processing thinking about those things that should just be, you know, a given in that brain system functioning like it needs to. Okay, so neuroquant, let's look at another neuroquant that has had a, a traumatic brain injury. So we see this inflammation all along that left side. Obviously, they hit their head on that left side, and that's really inflamed. This neuroquant was probably done recently after the accident, after the trauma. It, what I see in my practice is that if we don't get that inflammation calmed down, then we do start to see atrophy as we go. So that's the thing is we want to hurry up and do that calming down of the inflammation. Of course, there's a very, very important process. We do not immediately calm down the inflammation right after the accident because we know that the macrophage, all the thing, all the immune cells that are needing to clear out all the debris and all the uh, bruising in the brain, they have to um, have that time, that window to do what they need to do. Otherwise, we're leaving all that debris up there and then it's just gonna create even more problems. You gotta do the housekeeping to get it out. But there's also a very important process that we do during traumatic brain injuries to make sure that you're passing through that the right way so that you're 
minimizing caloric intake. That's very important. I'll go into that in another talk, of course, talking about why that's so crucial. Um, we're making sure that all sugar, alcohol, all of that's out, anything like that, that can just interfere with the natural um, healthy inflammatory process and cause more of the unhealthy inflammatory processes. We want your immune system to get in there and do its job, but we don't want to add more to its load of what it's supposed to be doing. We want it to really focus on what it's supposed to do. And so there's a process of uh, like a couple weeks after we start to add in certain nutritive factors that will help to calm down the inflammation as we need to, and then start speeding up how the brain functions so that it can start regenerating and healing neuroplastic exercises that we can start doing, um, all of that. But that's after that little process of turning lights down, taking down as much of that neural activity as we can, and decreasing caloric intake right, right immediately afterwards. And so you can see on this side too, there's a little bit of talks about some of the symptoms and in a healthy person and then in a TBI patient, just kind of helping to see the differentiation as well. Okay, so back to mycotoxicity and biochemical toxicity. So this are some things that we can see on the neural quant. This patient is actually one of my ongoing patients right now started seeing her just a couple of months ago. And unfortunately, uh, she's not able to get out of her the moldy environment right now. She does have one of the mycotoxins like showing up in a really high level, a couple of others, but especially okra toxin is the one that showed up. She also has Lyme. And in the place that she lives, she has a lot of EMF towers all the way around. So one of the first things I coached her on was about EMFs and how important it is to take that into account. Since she can't get out of that environment, she just needs to have some other uh, little tools that can help to negate how her body reacts and responds to that. I love Blue Shield technologies for that. They have the Blue Shield Cube. Actually, one of my mentors, Dr. Brandon Brock, is who mentioned them first to me. And as I studied into all the different companies, they're the ones that I feel like has really the science to back it. And it's just, it, it's a cube that you plug into your house and it will help to um, like protect up to like a 3,000 square foot radius or so, uh, 3,000 square foot diameter, maybe, I think. Uh, and that's what will create like Kind of like a calming down of those EMFs. So the EMFs themselves cause a reaction within our body that's like, oh, I'm going to go into stressful, like sympathetic mode. I'm stressing out about this like um, stimulation that's coming in, this frequencies that are coming in. Well, what our but what the Blue Shield technology does and other similar ones to it, it can help to negate how your body reacts to it, to send another signal that's changing and oscillating in a certain way to where your body kind of just like gets used to it, calms down about it. So that's one of those concepts. Now let's move back to mycotoxins and how important this is. So this patient is still in a household where she's got the ongoing onslaught of the mycotoxins still going into her sinuses, still going into her eyes, ears, mouth, nose, all of the orifices that it can get into, and it's inflaming her brain. As you can see, there is it well what you would think of as inflammation. This is after chronic inflammation. This is the atrophy. So red is that atrophy you remember. And she's got a cross of frontal lobes, temporal lobes, some in the parietal lobes. Those temporal lobes are so, so atrophied. And um, what I did, this patient was, is a digital patient. She actually lives in a, another state up north, but she did fly down to see me in office. And I did some sinus work, ear adjustments, things like that, cranial work to really help to clear out some of the eustachian tubes. And this was one of those notable patients that when we did some of these ear adjustments followed by some of the drainage, she had so much drainage that she could feel coming down the eustachian tube. She described it as like a warmth, a warm fluid almost that was draining out. And she was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I feel like I needed this so badly. And of course we had her take some binder blends and charcoal and um, try salts and some of those other healthy things right afterwards, because we knew that's a lot of toxins that are draining out into your system. So we got to make sure that you've got some things to bind it up and carry it right out of your system. And so we did that. This neuroquant was taken before all of that was done. This was in the very beginning of me seeing her. And we do like to give about six months of the regenerative process, restorative process for us to get to see before we take a neuro, another neuroquant. So I'll film another video at some point in this next year and I'll be sure to include the before and after so that you guys get to see the great progress that we can make. 
Um, I do want to address the BCS test that's over here on the other side of the screen. So the BCS test, you can see the left eye and the right eye is compared. This is a super, super easy and very affordable. It's like, it's free to take the test, but then you can get it like $10, pay $10 more and you get like more of the um, like analysis of it and it puts it through like more of its, you know, more of as explanations. So it's really nice to be able to do that for a screening process for patients so that we don't have to go straight for the really expensive, you know, five, six hundred, seven hundred dollar testing for mycotoxins to see exactly which mycotoxins. We can actually screen to see, oh, you might potentially have mycotoxins. So let's go ahead and run the test. And now it's more worthy bang for your buck because we know that there's likelihood there. And so we know that this works because as mycotoxins mold, um, some of those other things are present, we know that it affects the visual contrast sensitivity within our eyes, within our optic nerve, and how our optic nerve is able to see the contrast on screens. So it's a great, great tool to use, and that's her um, subsequent visual contrast sensitivity test that she took about the same time that we did this neural pump. So we've got another patient here for you, and this is to compare some of the changes and the differences. This patient's out of the moldy environment. However, we are still in the process of clearing the mold. We have already cleared the mold um, for about three or four months. So it's one of those things that you can see the frontal lobe, temporal lobes are still a little inflamed, but we had already started clearing out the mold before we ran the neural quant. Um, it just was a little process for the patient was able to get in and uh, get the, the neural quant imaging done. So it, it, there was about three months worth of mold clearing before this one. And I think that that's why we, have, we didn't see it quite so atrophied as what the other brain was. And he also has, um, at the onset of this neural quant, that's whenever we were able to um, get a schedule to where he was able to start doing more of the neural plastic retraining exercises is what I uh, give to my patients. So we're going to run another one in about six months and we'll get to see that and then you'll be able to compare the before and afters. But I wanted to show the VCS test that's compared with that neural quant as well. So some of the, you can see up at the top, the mycotoxins that are present and then some of the symptoms, memory focus, fatigue, this is difficulty making decisions and headaches. Well, difficulty making decisions makes sense because that lateral orbital frontal is atrophied across the board, and that's one of those areas that's dealing with executive function and decision making. Um, and then, of course, fatigue, memory focus, that's all in that same area, too. All right, so let's talk about how these mycotoxins can get in. Mycotoxins and fungi, both they can crawl in through the sinuses. Uh, bacteria also, if we have markants present up in the sinuses, that can keep the the uh, sinuses inflamed that leads to ongoing chronic inflammation right there that's sitting so close to that brain. And we know that that blood brain barrier has to be sealed and healed as much as we can to have a shield against mycotoxins. Okay, that's a, that's a good rhyme right there. I'll just tag that one. So mold organisms, we know that, that um, they are living. They can crawl in, they can get in, and then they can go. So then we really, really have to make sure that we are trying to minimize that as much as possible. How do we do that? Get your immune system on board to pull it out, to take it out. But also we have to make sure that we're getting these sinuses cleared. So we do some nasal rinsing, sinus drainage, chiropractic work to do some tapping and some um, sinus uh, relief. I'll actually show you the technique right now. I'll give you this little free advice on if you have some sinus pressure, in your sinuses, it's good to just do once a week or so. Anyway, just to make sure that we're clearing it out during pollen season, whenever the trees are blooming outside, that's a good time to do it. So you just take your fingers and you're gonna, there are these sinuses that are up here in the frontal, and then we've got these that are down here in the maxillary. And you're just going to take your fingers and then do some tapping. So it's like with the tips of these fingers right onto the nail bed, the fingernail bed. The reason why is because this takes a tissue pool to really help to contact the bone of the actual cranial bone. And then you do some tapping. I hope you guys can see because I just realized that my window of like where I am is very small. So anyway, do some tapping for about 30 seconds or so in each of those regions. Very simple, very easy little technique. Of course, I go into a little bit more depth when I'm, uh, I see you in the clinic for sinus drainages. I do a little bit of cranial, cranial bone releases as well, cranial bone adjustments, because they can still move even though they're just suture lines. 
and then also ear adjustments in specific ways. And that's because we know the eustachian tube and the vestibular cochlear nerve is also a very easy source for that inflammation to crawl right into the brain. So the sinuses, you see how they're there with that eustachian tube leading up from them. That eustachian tube, it changes the horizontal uh, way that it's like angled throughout our aging process. So like kids are more horizontal and you know kids, they are notorious for getting more ear infections than we do as adults. That can lead to chronic neural inflammation as you're a child and then going into adulthood. And you know what? Typically, conventional medicine treats ear infections with antibiotics. So I always screen my patients and I ask them, okay, tell me how many ear infections did you have as a kid? Did you have uh, a chronic antibiotic use? Uh, did you have like um, did, did you have ear tubes put in, which can grow fungi right around that, and then that's constantly inflaming that brain and that vestibular cochlear nerve. That's so important that we get that all understood and figured out. And then also as adults, even um, we need to make sure that this eustachian tube is clear. So kids and adults alike, they get ear adjustments in my clinic. I like to make sure that these three little ear bones get a nice little tug gentle tug put on them. And what that will do is that can help to uh, kind of create like a negative vacuum seal pressure on release almost uh, to like release any of those little mucus plugs that get stuck up in that eustachian tube and that are letting that, allowing that inflammation to just stay up there and hide in that uh, vestibular cochlear region. So the vestibular cochlear nerve, let's see, the tympanic membrane is right here on the inside of this ear canal. And then we've got these three little ear bones here. There's the vestibular system that's going to give you balance. And that's what helps your uh, body to deal with coordination, coordination of movement and such. And then we've got this cochleus, which is taking in the signal and the auditory signals and sending it up that vestibular cochlear nerve right there into the temporal region. And uh, we know how important that is. I was always talking about earlier for the auditory signals coming in and telling your brain what all is going on in this outside environment. Also very important for our limbic system. So that's why nice, beautiful, quiet music can help to bring out the zen. And then, you know, you can get really pumped up too, you know, from other types of music. Um, so tinnitus, that's where tinnitus also can occur is in that cochleus. And so we got to make sure that that vestibular cochlear nerve is sending proper signals. And we have lots and lots of neuro regenerative exercises, neuroplastic exercises that we do using this cranial nerve in addition to all the other cranial nerves as well. Let's talk about some nutrition that we can do. So I love using this product and this is my, actually all my slides from the Mold Summit and I wasn't able to talk about the specific product brand. However, I'm allowed to talk about this because now I'm just filming this for my own um, website. And so this is Neural Flam by Apex Energetics, one of my favorite companies that I use. I trust them, I love this company. I get amazing results with this. So this is how I calm down the brain. This is how I calm down that fire. Remember how I showed you that brain inflammation that like creates almost like a fire and your brain's on fire. We've got to calm that down. We've got to protect the brain, decrease that neural inflammation. These, this contains the perfect synergistic, um, like products that really, really help with all these specific ingredients to get that inflammation calmed down. It also supports the antioxidant systems, it's healthy balance of microglial function. Microglia is like what I was talking about with the, in the brain, we want to make sure that um, we've got the microglia that they are doing what they're supposed to do and not being too hyperactive, not getting a little out of control and creating inflammation where they don't need to, but also housekeeping if we need them to do. Take out all the debris that we don't need anymore, especially with traumatic brain injuries and such. Okay, uh, we also want to support healthy immune responses, like whether or not the immune system reacts to, like, say, antigens. For example, we are taking in our food products. Sometimes there are severe reactions that we have to, like, say, gluten or dairy or some of these other food types. And we need to make sure that we're not having that ongoing constant onslaught of immune inflammation, and we want to decrease that response as much as possible. So healing the gut lining is very crucial to healing the blood brain barrier lining. And so um, that, and then also removing some of those toxins that we just really don't need, some of those genetic modifications and things. I actually, being blunt here, I do not like gluten and I do not like dairy. 
and I can see that from being in, in practice for several years now that the gluten, I've just seen so many of my patients react against it. And I, I like to tell my patients, you know what, there is a weak humor test by Vibrant America Labs. We can run that on you for just a couple hundred bucks or so. And it will tell you a black or white answer of yes or no if you react into wheat. Um, if you're reacting to gluten, if you're reacting to some of the other cross reactions to the gluten, and it also tells if you've got leaky gut. But really, any time that I see gluten in the body that somebody's reacting to, that brain is inflamed, and I cannot do much with it. It's like no matter how many exercises you're doing, how much regeneration, restoration you're trying to do to neurosynaptically get those connections firing, wiring, it's not going to matter. We've got to get that inflammation down. Dairy is pretty much the same way. I just, I don't see much of a need for it anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have to worry about stepping on any toes here since, you know, this is a private video. So dairy, I just think that, you know, if we were a cow, then great, we would drink that milk. The problem is, is that we are not. And so I don't want to get blown up like a cow. I want to be able to stay my normal weight, my healthy weight. I want to keep my brain um, de-inflamed. I don't want it to be built on products that, and ingredients that I'm taking in. From nutrition that is actually not healthy nutrition, that it's actually just going to be scaffolding that my brain is trying to build the brain, the, the brain matter with, and it's not, it's not, it's not good to keep that information in our bodies. Okay, moving on. I'm not going to talk on that too much, but gluten dairy is what I actually have my patients come off of first. 95% of them feel better just coming off of those two. And then of course, there's a couple of other food reactions that we go through as well. Um, but I never tell my patients that they can't ever go back to gluten or dairy. That's the thing. I do a little challenge with them. I say, come off of it for a bit, see how you feel. And then in a couple months, try it again. Let's, let's see what happens. And nine times out of 10, most of them are like, oh my goodness, I love what I felt like before when I was off of them. Let's just stay off them. It's so much easier. There's so many alternative products nowadays. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so the brain, of course, it has so many high energy requirements. As we were talking about, so many computations per second, so much that it's handling. We've got to fuel that energy source. NeuroPTX by Apex Energetics as well. Love this brand. Love this company. Love this product. I use this product to anytime that my patients um, talk about not having brain injury, they're having difficulty focusing, concentrating. This is like a natural A to B. I love it. I even use it sometimes for myself. Let's see, did I take one this morning? Yes, I did. Maybe that's why I'm speaking so quickly. <laughs> so this NeuroPTX, it fuels those different pathways in the brain that are requiring all those building blocks to get built quickly, the proteins to get built quickly quickly, the um, neurotransmitters, all that activity that needs to occur in the brain, that's what's fueling it. So we, I like to be able to stimulate those mitochondria, give it all the building blocks that it needs to fuel those high energy demands. And um, some of those things, you can see the ingredients listed in it. And of course, you can get these ingredients like here, a little here, a little there, a little there from other products. I just, this is my tried and true version of it. This product gets all of the synergistic effect there. So this is my go-to for brain injury, inner, in, um, energy. Love it. Also for neuroplasticity, whenever I'm having my patients be on their neuroplastic re regimes, um, the rehabilitation exercises, I'll go through phase ones, twos, threes, uh, and those different phases, as I'm going through them, I tell the patients why this neuroptx is so important to incorporate in. And so that's very, very crucial that we have energy sources, energy resources, and of course, healthy diet is crucial for that too, but that's another talk. I can go into that for a long time. Okay, the brain has such high oxygen and um, you know, uh, the, the blood flow that gets to the brain, it requires that oxygen transport. So we know that that circulation, that vascular tone, all of that needs to be primed as much as possible. Like I was saying that 200 as miles that we've got of, of the blood vessels in the brain, that's sending that signal in. And we know that that is taking all the blood flow in. And if we do not have uh, the proper like oxygen, nutrition, blood flow, all of that, then those signals will be decreased. Like, so for example, we, we know that the cognitive capacity, the, um, you know, ability for communication in neurons, all of that's going to be decreased because where are the building blocks? Where are they coming from? So we've got to increase that vascular tone. 
these are a couple of the um, ingredients that are listed in it. Root is amazing for helping to get that blood flow into those capillaries, those tiny little capillaries, as you can see on this beautiful thing over here, that these, this, they extend out all the way throughout these brain tissues. And these are just some of the main vessels that are actually depicted in this artwork but the capillaries spread throughout everything, and especially even uh, in that white matter and that myelin, you'll see that's actually pink whenever in a living human brain, and that's because of the capillaries that are in between that eye myelin shape. It's so important that it's spread perfectly and um, sustainably throughout. So vincostatine really opens up the blood flow, ginkgo biloba, notorious for that. I actually do this whenever I'm going skiing in the mountains or going into high altitude because I love how this, oh, and this is Neural 2, by the way, Neural 2 by Apex Energetics. Um, I love how this gets that oxygen into that brain and it's able to keep my brain having plenty of oxygen, even though I might not be um, able to get as much in because of the altitude. Uh, and then also, yeah, this is great for helping with like the immune processes the same way. So it can help support the um, NF kappa B signaling and some of those other things, which is very, very, plays a huge role in that inflammatory process. So great antioxidant protection for the brain. Also really, really good for helping to prevent the neurodegeneration too. So I use this in a lot of my um, Alzheimer's dementia type patients and stuff like that to try to help get more blood flow into that brain. Okay, so let's talk about neuroplasticity. So this is where we actually use neuroplasticity. Your brain is constantly doing either a positive or a negative neuroplasticity, wiring or, re or unwiring it according to what we need in our brain. If we're not using it, we are losing it. If we are using it, then we need to use it more to try to get and encourage more neuroplastic connections. So let's talk about how we can use the 12 cranial nerves for neuroplasticity. I'm just going to go into some of the basics of this. So the 12 cranial nerves, we know that each one takes in signals from various areas, olfactory is the nasal, um, the eyes, the optic. We were talking about that with visual contrast sensitivity, but anything that your eyes are taking in, all the visual comprehension and all that. Um, the eye muscles, cranials three, four, and six. This is one of my biggest go-tos for my eye exercises. Um, the way that I, I learned from Dr. Krausian and Dr. Brenda Brock, they taught me that whenever we're stimulating the eyes, whenever we're moving the eyes in specific in certain ways, um, then that's whenever we're able to really get that signal to go into various parts of the brain. So we know that these different cranial nerves insert onto the pons and pontomedullary region, which is that little sticky part of the brain right up here, and different areas. So that plays an impact role on which part of the brain that we're stimulating. But also these, this part of the brain will send signals to other lobes in the brain. Like for example, the frontal lobe, that deals with cicada eye movement. So we can actually move our eyes back and forth from one dot to the next. That's a cicade, stimulates the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe, this is this area up here. We know that we can use a pursuit movement little movement like this. And that will stimulate the parietal lobe and that requires that movement of the muscles and the eyes to be able to send that signal up. Uh, we can also use trigeminal nerve, any sensory function to the face, different branches, branch one, two, branch three, we can use these. I actually love using this with my patients that have ticks and motor, um, like, you know, tick jewelry and things like that, that we, we have these different movements that they of signaling the brain misfiring. It's kind of like an electrical misfire. And we can actually use this trigeminal nerve to stimulate that some of the parts of the brain to calm those parts of the brain down. So that's one reason. Uh, so then just pretty much everything else, uh, you know, like we were talking about cerebral cochlear nerve, any of these, you take the function that this does, and then we know that where it wires into the brain, and we know that that's how we can activate these different areas, different levels of the brain. That's how I'm able to put together my very specific neural rehabilitation exercises that I have for each and every single patient. Um, the vagus nerve, I do want to note, mention this one because that vagus nerve is so important for digestion, for bodily function, lung movement, for your heart, for every single thing from here down to the middle of your chin, all the way down to the rectum. We've got to have proper functioning of that vagus nerve. There are a lot of different exercises that we can do. I have a separate talk for that, but um, this one's just kind of going over it briefly. Just know that that's crucial. That is so important. 
So this is just a quick little example of some things that I'll have patients do at home. This is not the specific rehabilitation exercises, this is the general. So this is something that I say, you can do this with your whole family because it's only gonna make their brains healthier, it's never gonna hurt them. Now with the specific exercises that I do, that's where I'm able to actually um, to train them, okay, this part of your brain specifically is down, so we're gonna go ahead and move your eyes in this direction multiple times over, and it's very different from the general exercises. So just a couple of these, what we do is we take the function of the frontal lobe and we say, whatever is functionally stimulating the frontal lobe, whatever is a function of the frontal lobe is what we use to stimulate it. So like paying attention to rhythm, that's in focus, and that's also dealing with language and our ability to comprehend speech and be able to carry on a really good conversation and have good comprehension, which is very important for relationships and such. Um, to Kate, I moved that's like I was talking about visual stimuli, uh, being able to interpret it and um, learning new songs, coordinated hand and finger movements, so types of things. Temporal lobe stimulation, I just want to show you kind of the difference between the different lobes and this is to help you have an overall concept of what I'm talking about neuroplasticity, but we go into that in a lot more detail in other talks. So this is like listening to music in the contralateral ear, um, versus one side versus the other, it'll cross over, and then uh, being able to like have that visual stimulation coming in from up above, in the superior quadrant is what we say, it's the ear, that's temporal lobe, so I could have the patients come bring their finger to like midline and then go up there and then back down, or horizontally up there, that's all stimulating to that temporal region. Um, pointing finger to nose, we know that that helps. That also stimulates parietal lobe too, uh, but I'm not going to go into all of that. It just helps give you some ideas and concepts to really get that broad understanding of what neuroplasticity is. So I hope you like this talk. I know that's a lot of information and a little bit of time, but of course, each one of these different areas that I talked about, I do talk about in other talks. I do have other blog posts and things. And of course, if you have any questions for me, if you'd like me to analyze your brain, if you'd like to give you a specific set of exercises that are targeted specifically for your brain, if you'd like to see a neuroplan, so if you're on your own brain, they're actually really affordable. Neuroplans are, it's amazing how they've been able to bring that pricing down on them. Um, if you'd like to, you know, hear anything else, anything more about this, let me know. You know I do uh, free 10 minute phone consults. Um, just get on the schedule. There's a waiting list for that. And I call you as I'm able to get some time. But that's because what I do is so diverse and so interesting and so different that sometimes patients are like, I don't even know if this is a good fit for me because I don't even know, you know, what can you do to help me? And sometimes their problems are so complex that they've been to 20 other specialist doctors. And they're like, I don't want to train anymore. I'm just so about to give up. And that 10 minute consult with me is I'm able to listen to your specific four or five main symptoms that you have. Maybe you like your health concerns to be taken care of. And then I can tell you, okay, this is how this relates. That's how that relates. This is what I would do in a broad scope. Let's get started. Or maybe I can't tell. And I am very honest about that. If I feel like I can't, I will send you to a colleague of mine who I know probably can. So anyway, much love to you all. I'm so glad that you were, I was able to share this with you and I hope you enjoyed. And I will definitely be filming more of these in the future. DrLaylaDoolittle.com. I just realized, you know what I should end this on? <laughs> it's telling you guys how to find me. I'm sure you already have because this is listed on one of my multiple um, different platforms. However, I also know that you probably don't know about or don't know about all the other platforms and you may want to. Um, and so let's go through that really, really quick. <laughs> Instagram, I'm Dr. Leila Doolittle. It's D-R-L-E-I-L-A Doolittle, B-O-O-L-I-T-T-L-E. And then um, I think on Twitter, I'm Dr. Leila Doolittle. Dr. Lily did a little without a dot was not available for some reason. So I'm that. And then on Facebook, Dr. Lily do little, that's where I post a lot of articles, a lot of research studies, a lot of things that I find fascinating. A lot of my colleagues posts that are also very educational and uh, very interesting to read. And then my own things that I put out, I'll post it there. YouTube channel, Dr. Lily do little. And um, on my website, 
drlaylaDoolittle.com. You can email me at info at drlaylaDoolittle. Next time I do this talk, I'm going to have a little slide there at the end for that. <laughs> okay, much love to you all. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.